my homework. If, if, if you haven't yet and you want to turn in the homework, I'll pick it up at the end of this table over here. Um, and I'll just pick it up at the end of class there. Um, but before we, um, before we jump into class, we want to open in a word of prayer. So if you would, please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day and the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for your son Jesus who died for our sins and provides salvation through faith and obedience to your holy and divine word. And we thank you for your word that gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And we thank you for the blessings that lie in your son. And we pray that as we study a portion of your word and a topic that, um, that discusses your nature and your, the triune nature of your being, being three in one, uh, Father, we, we pray that um, we pray that as we study it, we'll glean and learn more as we dig into the riches of your, your word. And we pray that you'll forgive us those things we've done in transgression of your word. And we pray that we will repent of them and come to um, an understanding of the error of our way, that we might correct those things before it be everlasting too late. And Father, as we go into this class this evening, may everything that we teach be according to the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help us, Father, and that the consummation of all things we have brought glory and honor unto you, your son, your spirit, and your church. Father, we thank you, we love you, and it's by the authority of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's jump right in here. Let's get to where we end it. And by way of review, we were discussing... Let's get this. Come on. Go. We ended right there as we concluded on God being just. So by way of review, we're going to look back at this, this, uh, this screen and then we'll just we'll go forward, okay? So dealing with God's justice as we were making reference to the last time we met, um, and, and I forget who brought it, I think it was Reggie who, who brought it up um, in Genesis 18 um, when God was talking to Abraham and he was going to be just in in his visitation to Sodom and Gomorrah and we know that Lot was there and Abraham pleads for those righteous that God would find in Sodom and Gomorrah and wouldn't destroy them and in Genesis chapter 18 verse 25 if we could turn there Genesis 18 25 Abraham said that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked and that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That obviously is, is rhetorical, right? That's rhetoric. We know that, we know Abraham knows the, the answer to that, um, but, but he is appealing to God's character, right? His justice. Will not, the, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Won't God always do right? Yes, God will always do right. And as we talked about last class period, we are really necessarily talking about God's sovereignty when we're talking about everything that God does being right he is the judge and righteous judge at that remember that Paul said in his final epistle in that final chapter of his final epistle that he wrote to Timothy in 2nd Timothy chapter 4 when when Paul said and the Lord the righteous judge say I give to me in that day and not to me only but unto all them also that love is appearing verse number eight so we know that we know that God is the righteous judge, and everything he does is right. He can't, he can't make a mistake. Obviously, there are some things that God can't do. God can't do anything that's opposed to his nature. Uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 2, and the hopes of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So God cannot lie. God cannot sin. God can't have darkness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. And so God can't do things that are opposed to his divine nature. All right, so both Solomon and Paul understood the goodness and severity of God. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 32, as, Paul, as Solomon is dedicating the temple, let's turn over to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 32. Then hear thou from heaven and do and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head and justifying the righteous, to give him according to his righteousness. God is a just God. He rewards according to righteousness. Solomon understood that and so did Paul. When Paul was writing to the Romans and he would address the Gentiles about this schism that was happening there at, Cor uh, excuse me, at Corinth, 
at Rome um, between the Jews and the Gentiles and the Gentiles would uh, serve tit for tat with the Jews and they would tell the Jews if y'all were so great then why did God why did God cut y'all off and graft us in right and and Paul told the Gentiles hey be careful be careful just just as much as God grafted you in he can graft you out just as much as God grafted you in he can cut you off too Right. And then he said, verse number 11, behold, the goodness and severity of God. Right. Goodness on those that do right. Severity on those who do not. Right. So behold, the goodness and the severity of God. So both Paul, Solomon and Paul understood that God was good and severe. God's nature, again, demands he not overlook sin, but judge it. We saw this in Exodus 23, 6 and 7. Um, we made note of Psalm 5, 4. Nahum warned Nineveh. Nahum chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. It's interesting that God was, God was spare Nineveh at Jonah's preaching, um, but he had to warn them through Nahum, right? And God, God was a God that spoke to nations in the Old Testament. If you ever read the book of Ezekiel, God has prophecy for Egypt, Tyre, Moab, right? God has prophecy for all these nations, these heathen nations. He is God. He will bring judgment upon them also. So God is a God of nations, the Old Testament, and he warns Nineveh by the prophet Nahum. For God to overlook, that is, pass over sin, even just one unrequited, one unpaid for, one unpunished sin would be to cease being holy and righteous, which obviously is against his nature. So God's very nature demands that he judge sin. It demands it. I mean, he has to. Um, one, God takes no delight in the punishment of the wicked. It saddens God. It hurts God when man chooses condemnation. That hurts God. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In the margin of your Bible, if, if these passages are not in the margin, and if you don't have a Bible that has margin passages, then, then I would tell you to write it somewhere in, in, in the margin. I want you to write Ezekiel 18 down for me. Ezekiel 18, if you, if you already haven't, um, I want us to notice Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Ezekiel 18, verse 23. This will be a cross-reference for, for 2 Peter 3, 9. I want us to notice Ezekiel 18, 23. Notice this. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord, and not, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Does God take pleasure that the wicked die? Does God smile when wicked people die? No. What about verse 32? Let's jump down to verse 32 in Ezekiel 18. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, said the Lord. Uh, said the Lord God, wherefore turn yourselves and live ye. God pleads with his creatures, his children of nature. He pleads with them. Choose life. Choose me. It saddens God, it hurts God when we choose, when humanity chooses condemnation, when humanity chooses, chooses to, not, to not live under the shelter, the spiritual shelter and protection of, of God. That, that hurts his heart. So God, Larry. Uh, a contrast on that, and you might be getting ready to make this because here it is that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But... The, when the, yeah, when the righteous die, God takes pleasure in that. Psalm 116, 15. Um, pleasure in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Yeah. So in that contrast, yeah, it hurts God when the wicked die, but it pleases God when the righteous die. Now he knows long, no longer has to share us with the world. Right? No longer has to share us with trials and tribulation and the influence of sin and and all of those things that come with the human condition. 
God no longer has to share, the, share us with those things when the righteous die. For God not to demand purity and to punish wickedness would be to abandon His infinite holiness. And we, and we're, we, we talked about God being holy. And that would be to abandon His infinite holiness. That would be tantamount, paramount in Him being God. His nature demands it. Apart from atonement, and I love that word atonement, I kind of break it down like this, at one meant, I, I, like, I like that word atonement, I know it's M-E-A-N-T, it's the way it's supposed to be, but listen, we're, we're playing words right here, okay, we're, we're playing on words right here, at one meant atonement, at one meant salvation, right, Jesus Christ, atonement, I like that word atonement, um, apart from atonement, God cannot forgive the transgressor, he can't forgive the transgressor. He wrote to, or at least the Apostle John said, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he wrote to his little children these things that they may, um, um, he wrote to them that they might understand that Jesus Christ was their propitiation. That's the idea of atonement. He was their propitiation, and not for their sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. He was the sacrifice of atonement. Really, that's the idea of propitiation. It's the, it's the atoning sacrifice. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, John said, I wrote these things that y'all might know, right? that you may understand that we have an advocate with the Father. If any man sin, I wrote these things that you don't sin, but just know that if you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation of our sins, the sacrifice of atonement, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. But will, will the whole world be saved, though, just because Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice? No. And we know that to be true because of how Jesus, as he, as he begins to conclude the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, what does Jesus say? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So just because he's the atoning sacrifice doesn't mean that everyone will take advantage of that sacrifice, which if it be the Lord's will, we'll talk about that in this lesson, okay? Um, let's, let's save that. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. All right, so in tonight's lesson, we want to pick up at God being merciful. What we're discussing is God, the person of God, three in one, the Godhead, which is what we would see in the three passages that we know that the Bible um, teaches that are part of our memory work, right? It's part of our memory work. Um, but the three places we find that New Testament it's the Godhead or the Godhood or the divine nature, right? It is God, the deity of God. Three persons, three personalities making up the one person God. When we, but before we can truly, truly dissect the three persons, we want to understand God's nature, right? The deity of God, His nature. Merciful. God is merciful. How could God... How could God freely give mercy? And, and mercy and grace, I don't know if I've said it in this class, but I say it often, they're, they're identical twins. They look alike, but they're different. Right? They, 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 they almost look just alike, but they're different. I like to define grace as um, getting what we don't deserve. Getting what we don't deserve. I like to define mercy as not getting what we do deserve. Not getting what we do deserve. All right? When people ask me and, and, and the Udawa members in here, they, they can attest to this. Every time somebody asks me how I'm doing, I say, better than I deserve. And they're like, oh, you deserve it? I'm like, no, when I deserve death, he, he, he provided life. Right? I'm better than I... He has been better to me than I've been good. Right? And so I'm on that good side of grace and mercy, and I love that. Um, but God is merciful, but he's also gracious, and those things are very close. How could God's mercy be freely given? Well, as we talked about justice, justice requires that sin be punished. Justice requires that sin be punished. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, remember that God gave the law in the garden. Because what is sin? 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Transgression of law. That's what sin Sin is a going beyond of the law. Well, can we trace sin back? Can we trace sin back? 
How far can we trace sin back? Yeah, Genesis, right? Genesis. So if we can trace sin back to Genesis, then there had to be some law before the sin. If, if sin is a transgression of law. Where would we find law before sin? <laughs> there you go. There you go, Genesis 2, 16, 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There you have it. There's your law. There's your law. And Adam and Eve sinned, and we know that they sinned. Because Paul, by inspiration, said that they sinned. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Whereas by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so then death passed to all men, for that all have sinned. So Adam sinned. God gave law. Sin is a transgression of law. Adam transgressed, he and Eve. Genesis 3, 6. And so God gave law. Man transgressed law. Sin comes in. But God also gave the consequence. Uh, the day that you eat it, that's going to bring death. Right? There's the consequence. And so, justice, justice requires that sin be punished. Right? Genesis 2.17. Ezekiel 18, chapter 4. Let's turn over there. I'm already there, but you may still already be there. Ezekiel 18.4. Behold, all souls are mine. God is the God of all people, whether or not they accept him. Right? All people are amenable to God's law, whether or not they accept it whether or not they want to, whether or not they believe, they are amenable to God's law. Just because I don't want to believe in a stop sign doesn't mean that I won't get pulled over if I run one. Right? Doesn't mean I won't get a ticket. Right? Just because I don't believe the speed limit is 70 doesn't, believe, doesn't mean I won't get a ticket if I go beyond that, if I transgress and go beyond 70. Right? It doesn't matter what I, what I believe. If there is a law... And I'm amenable to it, generally speaking, right? Generally speaking. We're talking about God's law. And I say generally because I'm not amenable to a law in Afghanistan, right? I, I live in America. There's, there's some nuances there. But when we're talking about God's law, all of humanity, all of creation is amenable to God's law, okay? Whether or not he believes it. So in Ezekiel 18.4, God said, all souls are mine. All souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And remember in verse 20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son, but the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Now this is clearly, this is clearly a death knell for the, the terrible tulip, this is surely a death knell to that damnable doctrine of, of Calvinism. Um, total hereditary depravity. That is the T in the tulip. That acrostic, the T-U-L-I-P. And the T is total hereditary depravity, meaning that we inherit the sins of our parents who inherited the sins of their parents who inherited the sins of their parents, which spans all the way back to the first parents, Adam and Eve. Well, what does God say to Ezekiel? The son shall not bear the iniquities of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquities of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Larry. Uh, when you trace that back, you, know, mm -hmm. uh, you are getting into blasphemy because who was the parents of Adam? Yeah, God. That was God. Right. You're saying that you inherit the sins of the that God God is, is pure. God is holy. God does not sin. Right. And so therefore that doctrine is blasphemy towards God. Right. That would be a great question. Who sinned did Adam and Eve inherit? That'd be a great one. Christ. Christ gave grace and mercy. Christ gave grace and mercy. What did Moses give, John 1, 17? Moses gave the law, but what did Jesus Christ give? Grace and truth. He gave grace and truth. Let's notice Titus chapter 2. 
verse 11 through 14. Titus 2, 11 through 14. This is another passage that we, we, would, we would ask the question and we would demand an answer. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Notice, notice that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to some men. That again is, that, that's, that's Calvinism. Right? Unconditional election. So because you're totally depraved, God has to unconditionally elect you. That's the U, T-U-L. And those who are unconditionally elected, they receive the limited atonement. That means that Jesus didn't die for everybody. He only died for the unconditionally elected. Well, what does Paul say here in Titus chapter 2? Verse 11 through 14, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all. Not some. Not the limited atonement. Not those who were unconditionally elected. But just because his grace has appeared to all men again, let's note, a, let's note just what we just talked about just a few moments ago. Just because his grace has appeared to all men, does that mean all men will be saved? No. How does Titus, how does Paul tell Titus that the, this grace of God that has brought salvation, how does Paul tell Titus man must receive it? Yes. By it, because this grace teaches us to do what? To deny Deny worldliness, ungodliness, right? Teaching us that denying ungodliness, that we should do what? Live. So the grace teaches us obedience. It teaches us, oh, if you want me, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm speaking, you know, in terms of, of, of grace, right? Grace says, hey, if you want me, you've got to learn. You've got to learn to deny Sin, you've got to learn to, to, to look and to, to set your focus on Jesus Christ and obey Him. That's how you receive the grace. And so Noah found grace. Remember in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8? You remember what was happening in Genesis chapter 6? The world was wicked. God was going to kill everybody. As a matter of fact, He did. <laughs> Except for how many people? Eight. <laughs> matter of fact, He did. The world was bad. It was bad, bad, bad. But the, but the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace. Noah found grace. Back when everybody, when the world, the, is enti the world woke up and went to sleep in wickedness. They woke up and they had wickedness like we'd have a bowl of cereal. Like we'd have breakfast. And they woke up thinking about wickedness. Eating wickedness, sleeping wickedness, thinking, drinking, that all they did, the imagination of their hearts was only evil continually. God killed everyone. Right? But Noah found grace. Lot and his family. Lot was shown mercy by God. Genesis chapter 19. Let's turn over there. Look at what God says about, about, about uh, Lot. Now we know that Abraham is a type of Christ when he mediates, right? When he intercedes for Lot in Genesis 18. We know that Abraham is a type of Christ in that regard. But if we look at Genesis chapter 19, verse 16. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. God showed him mercy. God, God is merciful. We're not going to go over all of these passages. We're not going to go all over all of these passages. But you do have homework assignment in front of you, so there might be a question in there.
Let's say something about God's mercy in some scriptures, maybe. All right, so many verses, many verses express God's mercy, express God's mercy um, because he's a merciful God. He is a God of mercy. We can look at every one of these passages, Exodus 34, 6, Deuteronomy 4, 31, Nehemiah 9, 31, and these are not even all of them, right? These are not even all the passages that prove and show and illustrate the mercy of, of God. But God is a merciful God. God is a merciful God. You know that Jonah, you know, Jonah got upset with God, didn't he? Anybody, 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 anybody remember that story? As, I, as I've taught the book of Jonah, um, and I tell those who, who, who may be present, you know, when I've taught this, um, I know I did a, I discussed it a little bit, that PTP, talking about seeing the glory of the Lord. But when you consider Jonah, Jonah, and if you see Jonah as just a man in a well, right, then, then you need to reread the book, right? The book of Jonah is about the salvation of Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. God has sent Jonah to preach to those people. Jonah didn't want to do it, so he ran from God. And God, by miraculous means, sent Jonah to the city. Now, when Jonah preaches to these people, he preaches an eight-word sermon. He preaches an eight-word sermon to Nineveh. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He preaches an eight-word sermon to Nineveh, and they repent. They repent. Amen, Rick Owens. If we could preach an eight-word sermon and everybody repent, that'd be beautiful, wouldn't it? Jonah got mad because God didn't kill, because he didn't destroy Nineveh. He got upset. And guess what, and guess what he said about God? I knew I knew you. Let's, let's turn to Jonah. Let's turn to Jonah chapter 4. Because I want you to see this. He, he, he knew God was merciful. He said, I knew you. That's why I ran. Because I, I know who you are. You're a gracious God. Merciful, full of love and kindness. You repent of evil. Notice what he said in, in Jonah chapter 4. As I get there. Jonah was mad, man. He was upset with God. Notice what he said in verse number 2. Well, in verse number one, in verse number three, and God saw, verse number 10, excuse me, chapter three, verse 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them and he did it not. Verse number one in chapter four, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. Jonah was mad that God was good. Think about that. You know, who that would, you know who would have been in Nineveh at that time had he been alive? Eric Garner. I'd have probably been in Nineveh. Right? I'm glad, I'm glad that God didn't visit me when I was outside of the blood of his son. Right? And so, verse number 4, I mean, chapter 4, verse 1, he was angry. Verse number 2, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore... I fled before under Tarshish. This is the very reason I ran. This is the very reason I ran. For I knew. Look at that. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repent of thee of evil. Look at there. Jonah was actually upset that God spared Nineveh. Notice what God will say as he concludes this chapter, as he has to give, as, as, as Jonah goes and pouts. All right, as he goes and pouts, and he, he throws himself a pity party. Notice what, notice what God said in, in the very last verse. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city where are more than three score thousand persons, oh, excuse me, six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right, right hand and their left hand and also much cattle? Jonah, if you knew I was, if you knew I was a gracious God and merciful and 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 full of and full of kindness and re, and a repent of evil, like shouldn't I not just be me? Can I be anything but me? Should I not spare Nineveh if they repented? God is a merciful God. 
That is his nature. He's a merciful God, even in the Old Testament, because sometimes the God of the Old Testament is, is identified as God of wrath, the God of vengeance, the God of striking people dead. The God of the Old Testament, if he's not anything, he's merciful. He should have killed Israel a thousand times over. Right. Yeah. He said the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Right? He let the Amorites exist for 400 years, I guess it was. Right? I mean, you know, if he wasn't anything, he was merciful in the Old Testament. If we don't see anything about God in the Old Testament, we should see his mercy. From Genesis with Adam and Eve all the way to the New Testament, he has shown his mercy. Merciful, merciful, merciful God. God is rich in grace. God is rich in grace. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, Paul said, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according, if I can get there, to the riches of his grace. Yes. According to the riches of his grace. He's rich in grace and he's rich in mercy. Ephesians chapter 2, um, verses 5 through 9, we know that we're saved by grace, right, through faith. And God gave it to us through the avenue of His Son, Jesus. Gave us grace and mercy through the avenue of His Son, Jesus. How does one take advantage of... And, and, and you, might be, you, might be, um, you might be looking here. It looks a little bit different on this screen. I changed some things. Um, so I've, get, I've got some more updated information in your notes. But... By obedience, one takes advantage of grace. By obedience, one takes advantage of grace. That's how we take advantage of grace. We saw that in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. But notice what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the what of God? By the mercies of God. Yes, God is merciful. But what did Paul go on to say? By the mercies of God, that you do what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. When we talk about worship to God, friends, denying self, abstaining from sin, is in fact worship. As a matter of fact, that phrase, reasonable service, would be your Greek phrase, logikos latreia. And you know what that means? Logikos, what, what word does that sound like? Logical. Latreia, worship. That's your logical worship. As I say at Udawa all the time, Romans 12, 1 and 2 catches Monday through Saturday. Right? We, we, we all, we look good, we smell good, we sound good on Sundays. But Romans 12, 1 and 2 catches Monday through Saturday. Right? Presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. That's all the time, friends. That's the life of a Christian. That's the life of a Christian. Did you have something, Rick? What's that? Logikos. Um, L-O-G-I-C. O-S. Mm-hmm. So, the word... Um, Elio in, in the Greek is defined as compassion or pity. It's the most common Greek word translated mercy. It's the most common Greek word translated mercy in your New Testament. What was that mean? Um, it's in those notes, Larry, right there. No, you're good. You're good. E-L-E-E-O would be your transliteration. That would be your English. That's, that's your English letters. That is the most. Now, that's not the only word translated mercy, though. But it is the most translated word mercy in the New Testament. And it means compassion or pity. We, we made reference to Noah earlier in Romans, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 6 verse 8. What does Genesis 6, 8 say about Noah? He found what? He found grace where? In the eyes of God. Now, question. Could Noah rest in that alone? That he found grace in the eyes of the Lord? So could Noah sit back and say, 
Man, I'm good. Could he just put his hands behind his head, kick his feet up and say, yep, I'm good. Nothing I got to do. Let's go to Genesis 6.14. Go to Genesis 6.14. If grace alone without man's acceptance of it is enough, why do we have Genesis 6.14? What did God say to Noah? Make thee an ark. Wait a minute, Lord, I thought I found grace in your eyes. Why I got to make an ark? Why do I have to do that? I found grace. I'm saved by grace, right, God? I found grace in your eyes. I'm saved by grace. Noah, you got to make an ark. You got to accept this grace, buddy. If you don't make an ark, you're going to die with everybody else, man. Right? You got to make an ark. Make thee an ark of Gover wood. Now we get even more specific. Don't just make an ark. Make it of Gover wood. Rooms thou shalt make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Now we're getting specific, even about the commands that God gives Noah to accept the grace that he received, obviously, in verse number 8. Grace is free. There is no debate about that. As a matter of fact, we get accused often of being graceless people. And I think I can understand where that sentiment may come from, but I can promise you neither I nor any of my gospel preacher friends have I ever heard them preach that grace doesn't save. I've never heard that. I've never heard it. Now, I can, I can understand how some can misunderstand um, that they think we believe that, right? That's, that's a whole different conversation. So I think I can understand the sentiment. But friends, I know for a fact I have never taught that, and neither have any of my, my gospel preacher friends that I know. We teach and believe that we're saved by grace. But we understand that grace, though a free gift, still must be received. I could give every one of you in here, I could hand you $100 all day long. If you don't accept it, you don't get the $100. It's still a gift. It's still free. You still got to take it. Grace is a free gift. Yes, but what did Paul say in, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10? For by grace are you saved, but then he qualifies it. How? Through faith. Right? We are saved by grace through faith. Faith is our part. Grace is God's part. Right? Man, cost him his life, didn't it? Yeah. That's a great that's a great uh analogy. Larry. Acts two thirty seven. The people were pricked in the heart. Mm -hmm. Man and brethren, what shall, shall we do? do? There, there, was, there was something they needed to do. Yeah. There was something they needed to do. Great thoughts. Great thoughts. God is merciful. God is self existent. We are going through God's character. We're going through his, his character, his attributes. God is merciful. God is self-existent. A child's question, who made God, is a perfectly natural and proper question. Have you ever asked that question? Yes. I know I asked that question. I have asked that If God made me, who made God? Listen, just don't even ask it, right? It's just, it'll drive you crazy, right? We, because we are trying to, we are trying to comprehend of an infinite God, which we'll talk about in a moment here. We're trying to comprehend an infinite God with a finite brain. It, it just, it just, listen, we, we joke about Deuteronomy 29, 29, but it is true. Deuteronomy 29, 29 is really true. Even though we kind of joke about it, right, for the secret things belong unto God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Right? I mean, we joke about it and say, hey, that's the Deuteronomy 29, 29 thing. And that's true, but it really is true. Like the things that God has revealed, those things belong to us. But God didn't reveal everything to us in all of creation, everything he ever has ever known. Right? God hadn't revealed those things to us. Not everything. What he has revealed to us is enough. It's enough for us to be pleasing to God and get to where he is. Right? So when we make questions, when we ask questions like that, you know, if God created us, who created God? You know, God is self-existing. Okay, and we'll talk about that. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, the world could have been written. Yeah, the world couldn't have enough libraries to contain all the books. Yeah. But now that we got, there's a lot more, and there are a lot more things to do. Stuff. Yeah, but we don't need to worry about. 
Yeah. We have what we need. Let's move on. Yeah. John 20, 30 and 31. Truly did Jesus many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believe you may have life through his name. And so, yeah, there were several other things Jesus did, even in his earthly ministry, that we don't have recorded, but the things that we have are proper. Right? They're proper, and the Holy Spirit revealed them unto us, and we know that he's perfect. He's perfect in his revelation. So everything we, everything we need, we've got. But it is a natural question. It's the human condition, right? It is a natural question. Um, and so it's a natural and proper question, but the true answer is perhaps not such as the child would expect. Let's turn to John 5.26. I love this passage um, because in it, uh, Jesus um, gives us a truth here that is what we would call axiomatic. What that means is that it's true it's, it's just true. There's no, right, it doesn't need to be proved. It's true because it's true. And so Jesus says here in John 5, 26, for as the Father had life in himself, he's not even debate. it's not even something up for debate. He's not proving this. It's a stated fact by Jesus. It's just an axiom. It's just true, right? He says, as the Father had life in himself, so hath he given unto the Son to have life in himself. So, God is the source of all life and all that exists, whether living or material. He created everything, and we've already, we've already visited that to some degree in, in a previous lesson. But everything, everything that exists and that continues to exist is by God and by the Word of God. I'm, I'm preaching a sermon series um, on Hebrews in the evening in the evening um, service assembly, and we we we've just come out of the gate and we've dealt with the sevenfold superiority of Jesus over the prophets in Hebrews chapter one verses one through three. And one of the reasons Jesus is greater than the prophets is because he upholds all things by the word of his power. He's the creator of everything, and he upholds everything. The reason the stars haven't fallen out of the sky is because he hasn't let them. He upholds them. They consist. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17, for he is before all things. By him all things consist. It's by his word that he upholds all of natural law. Well, he created everything, and so that makes sense. It makes sense that, that he would be the one to sustain if he's the one that created As we've talked about deism, deism is the idea that God set the world on autopilot. Just like, all right, we're going to set it on autopilot. I'm going to wind this thing up, and as soon as it's done, ticket, boom, that's it. You know, that's deism. That is not the God we serve. He is active in creation through his providence. He is active in the world. He upholds all things. That means, that means he's active. That means he's currently holding all things by the word of his power. He's not an absentee landlord. Well, he's self-existent. And so God has neither, God has neither beginning, um, he has neither beginning nor end. He always was, always is, and always will be. It's not possible, it's not possible for man to properly portray the eternity of God. Um, and, that, and that is true. The eternality of God is, is difficult. It's, we can't, it's, it's hard to comprehend. The scriptures often refer to God as eternal. And here are some passages, we won't go through them all, but here are some passages that tells us um, that God is eternal. Since God is eternal, that means no beginning, no end. That's what that means. Um, and all life originates from him, well, it follows, logically, that he's the author of, if he's the author of physical life, then it logically follows that he would be the author of eternal life which the Bible reveals that he certainly is in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. He became the author of salvation to all of them that obey him. He's the author of salvation. God being infinite. God is infinite in presence. That is omnipresent. Eternity affirms that God is not limited to time. So omnipresence affirms that God is not limited to space. 
God is not temporal. That means he's not physical. Therefore, he is not confined to one place. I love this passage. This is the one I'll, I'll make reference to and we'll move on. 1 Kings 8.27 as Solomon is dedicating the temple. And he's praying. He said, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I've built it. God is omnipresent. God is infinite in knowledge. That means he's omniscient. That means he knows all. He sees all. He is infinite in knowledge, complete in knowledge. God is infinite in power. That is omnipotent. That means he's omnipotent. He is all powerful. With that power, he also has authority. We'll wrap up right here. Matthew 28, 18, when Jesus resurrected and he gave the great commission. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. That word is not our word dunamis that we normally see, which we get our modern day, modern day term dynamite. It's the word asusia. It is authority. We'll consider ourselves dismissed. We we'll appreciate your undivided attention as the lesson was taught. May God bless you and keep you as you seek to conform your will to his.